Um, so I was was born in D.C., but I've spent most of my life in Rhode Island. Uh, folks, you know, my folks moved there for work back in the day, and you know, I went to went through all of school there. I went to college there. Um, graduated college about ten years ago, and I mean, I've traveled a lot for work, but yeah. that's always kind of been home. Nice. Dan, where did you grow up? Versus I I grew up in Pennsylvania. Okay. So. Central Pennsylvania, where we have lots of farms, <coughs> dairy farms, and uh, so dairy farms are on one side of the house, and uh, uh, black uh, uh, cattle were on the other for raising, and then we had horses. Um, so I was very rural where I <laughs> grew up. So Did you have your own horse growing up? I did not have my own horse, but I did ride horses. Yeah, I always wanted a horse. I did a horseback riding camp growing up, but never got my own horse. <laughs> they're very, they can be very gentle, uh, you know, they're like any animal. Zach, where'd you grow up? I will uh, one-up Dan's ruralness as I grew up in Nebraska, as uh, landlocked as it gets. So yeah, I grew up in a really small town of just about 8,000 people. Um, where pretty much everybody knew everybody. We always joked our parents knew what we were up to before we knew what we were up to, just because everybody keeps track of each other there. Um, but it was, yeah, it was a great time. Lived there my entire childhood, basically, um, until college. Then I came out to uh, UH Hilo, and uh, I've been out here for about the last decade now. Um, so, yeah. Johan, where did you grow up? Uh, I'm from Amherst, Massachusetts, so Western Mass, a little, little inland, but still close enough to the coast that we would go sometimes. Uh, it's a pretty rural area, and the it's known for having five colleges in the same town. So oh wow, that's a lot of colleges in yeah. such a small town. Yep, uh, the big one being UMass Amherst, and then small ones like. Uh, Amherst College and Hampshire College and Mount Holyoke, etc. Um, so we had a really big population over the uh, course of the academic year, and then summer times were pretty slow, which was always very nice. We're starting to get a little more life here. Um, Simon, how about you? So I grew up in uh, what's called a region called the West Midlands in. Uh, in England, part of the United Kingdom, um, just a little west of a city called Birmingham in an area that's called the Black Country, the Black. which was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. So a lot of glass making and uh, steel works and everything else when I was growing up. So Stuart Crystal is the, is the local crystal glass works. Uh, I left there when I was 17 to join the Royal Air Force and lived all over the UK and three years in Cyprus and various other places. And then Mike. Uh, I grew up uh, mixed between the West Coast and Hawaii. Um, and then when I started college, I moved uh, over to Oahu and uh, was on Oahu for about 20 years. And then uh, the last two, two and a half years, I've been uh, okay. living over in New Jersey with uh, my fiance, but we just uh, picked up and are starting our move back to the islands. Ah, well, welcome back to Oahu. Yeah. And now you're homeless. <laughs> now I'm homeless. Living in your truck. <laughs> That's a home. <laughs> <laughs> it has a roof, right? Exactly. There it's got go. a roof. Have a dog. It's a happy place. And it comes to the Nautilus to do his laundry. <laughs> <laughs> And your fiance also works going abroad as well. Yes, so she is currently uh, up in Greenland, up at Summit Station, uh, is spending the winter up there. So she's a research technician up there. Maybe, w have you guys ever done a work project together? Yeah, we both worked uh, down in Antarctica together, which is actually where we met. So um, we did two years working together down there and then uh, Found love in the frozen sea. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And then Dave, how about you? Where'd you grow up? Uh, born and raised in Seattle, Washington. Uh, lived there the first uh, 18 years of my life. What neighborhood of Seattle? Renton. Right. South End. Went to Renton High School. Uh, 1975, I moved to uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and uh, have been there pretty much ever since. Uh, moved to Wisconsin for a while. Oh, where in Wisconsin? Wis Madison. Oh, my sister went to college at Madison. Love Madison. It's a great place. It's a college town. And I was working for a software company. That was a very interesting time. Uh, they picked me up and moved me to L.A. So I lived in L.A. for a year, Santa Monica. Uh, moved back to Alaska for a year or so. Moved to Seattle. Spent eight years back in mm -hmm. Seattle. Uh, following a job there, that job ran out. I ended up back in Alaska again. And now we split time between Alaska and the coast of Oregon. Nice. Well, I grew up, um, my dad's military, so I moved around a lot. I was born in California, um, went to Hawaii, to Wisconsin, to Guam, back to Wisconsin. I actually, because I'm darker skinned, that when I lived in Hawaii, I thought I was Hawaiian. So I would, when we moved to Wisconsin, I went to, my parents had a parent-teacher conference and they're like, oh, your daughter's so proud of her heritage. And they're like, uh, what, like Mexican? And they're like, no, Hawaiian. And so they had to have a conversation with me about my heritage and <laughs> teach me that I was not actually Hawaiian. But yeah, I came back to Hawaii about seven years ago, eight, something like that. So I've been there ever since for now. And where in Wisconsin were you? We, I, we first were at, the first time we went to Wisconsin, we were in Waukesha. Yeah. And then we moved to, when we came back after Guam, we were in Franklin, which is kind of suburbs of Milwaukee. Oh, okay. And then my parents moved up to um, Oconomowoc area when I went to college in, at USC. So they okay. moved up to Oconomowoc and then they left Wisconsin and moved to Italy and we're in wow. Italy yeah and then went to around East Co Florida no I, yeah Florida North all over military you know but my dad did go into the reserves when I was in high school for a bit so that we didn't I could go to high school in one place so I was able to stay the entire time at Franklin High School and graduated from there and then my dad got activated to go to Iraq again and so he went back on active duty is this a really big fly trap anemone? Or is it a sponge? What do you think, Zach? It looks like some type of anemone. I think as we get closer, we'll be able to see. Yeah, it looks just like the, the Venus fly traps. It yeah. does, but just a lot bigger than ones I've ever seen before. Um, Dave, maybe you'll know the answer to this question. Does Nautilus and Okeanos Explorer ever interact since they run similar ROV systems? Um, not that I know of, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't have happened in the past and might happen again in the future. Uh, the Oki is going to be out here in the Pacific more uh, over the next couple of years from what I hear. Uh, and so there's a chance that we may cross paths. Yeah, there's, um, so there's, in terms of like the day-to-day, -day, you know, like ship operations, uh, there's usually not a whole lot of interaction, but in terms of like the larger big picture, uh, like strategic level scale, both, uh, some of the ship time on both vessels is funded by NOAA, the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute. So at the, at the OACI level, uh, there's a distribution of, you know, the, Okeanos has been operating around Alaska. It's a, Oki is a little bit more tolerant of ice than the Nautilus. So, you know, if you're looking at the US EEZ uh, exclusive economic zone in the Pacific, so the OECI is, is, is funding exploration of that. So, you know, Nautilus focuses more on the, the warm water regions of the Pacific, uh, whether it's Hawaii, Samoa, Guam, whereas Oki focuses on the cold water regions because it's more ice tolerant. Um, and they're, in terms of, 
you know, so there's there they get allocated to different parts based upon their capabilities. But there's also there have been a couple media and sort of uh, education outreach events. Usually, like World Oceans Day, there'll be uh, there might be a you know a, a show or a presentation uh, in both ships. In the past, we've had a, we've done shows where both ships have called in. Very cool. Thank you, Rachel. And I think Jason was talking this morning that the live feeds all go back to your uh, shore station for both the Okeanos Explorer, this, and then a uh, ship in the Gulf of Mexico. Yep, there is uh, right now, so URI has a center that specializes in telepresence, especially <coughs> video, called the Inner Space Center. And all of the Nautilus live feeds, um, all the Okeanos Explorer feeds, and also, you know, in Vessels of Opportunity, go through the uh, rack room at the o Ocean Science and Exploration Center over at URI's Narragansett Bay Campus. Yeah, I got to visit that when I was doing my training for coming out here. It is really amazing. Very cool to be in. Mike, someone has a question for you in the chat. Is it hard, harder working together with your spouse or being apart for so long? <laughs> uh, my fiance and I work really well together. Um, it's, I think it's harder for us to be apart from each other. Uh, but at the same point in time, we're both working the the same season right now, so. Uh, so it's kind of nice because when you're off, you're both off. And exactly. That you get to do what you want. Yeah. Do you guys ever travel together? We do. Uh, we actually just finished our cross Canadian road trip this uh, summer. Oh. Uh, so we've done that. Uh, we've traveled uh, around the U.S. as well, and then um, I have plans to be going over to Portugal this uh, this upcoming spring. That sounds fun. We have another one of those um, stalked crinoids, our lilies. So what was everyone's dream job when they were a kid? Rachel, what was your dream job when you were a kid? Oh, geez. Uh, I had a bunch of them. Um, I, had a, I had a couple different options. You know, I was always a very, in, well, still am very imaginative. Uh, in some cases, too imaginative. We were talking, we think you should become a science comedian. We think you'd be very good at that. I think, uh, you well, have I think. Great I'm, delivery. I think I'm coming up already doing yeah. that. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you can use SPL Nautilus to launch your future, your comedic career. Yeah, hang on. Let me let me switch this headset. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, you know, what's the deal with science communication? You know, they they talk about. Uh, you know what? I, I didn't have that one knocked out. Um, A for effort. Thanks. Uh, yeah, um, you know, I had a couple of them, very imaginative, very head in the clouds. Um, my, probably my dream jobs were gonna be either a, an electrical engineer, which is what I'm doing now. Um, it was either that, or either being an electrical engineer or being a surgeon. Okay. Um, the decision was made by, uh, so I found out, you know, I have ADHD. Uh, growing up, did not know that, so I kind of struggled in school, did not have the grades for any kind of medical pathway, so it was, you know, easier decision. Um, I, uh, you know, 
especially like you know once so once you just turn 30 like you just immediately like look back at your life and i was like oh what i think the i think the biggest thing that would have been nice about being in the operating room was that you have somebody to keep track of your stuff for you um you also get to give orders to everyone which is awesome because right now in the back row i'm actually receiving a lot of orders and that you know <laughs> Uh, I'm not really like it's like okay sure I'll do it but it's like oh, <laughs> really it doesn't it doesn't really give you this you know it's it's great to be part of this team but it's also it's a little bit of a, like an ego death kind of thing it's like oh I'm not the most important person in the room <laughs> I have to like so if you're a surgeon you'd get that are you saying you want a power trip here Rachel Is that yeah absolutely <laughs> I want a power trip <laughs> I just I want to I want to just I want to have like some like CS interns like I don't I, this this current like this bit of software like I don't want to write this you know <laughs> I just want to tell somebody what it needs to do and like here's the conditions and here's the in, here's a, w in a way isn't that what you're doing with the computer isn't your computer your minion you're telling it what to do you're programming it mm -hmm. you're literally giving it instructions so the thing you got to realize though <laughs> is that and I know like with like ChatGPT computers seem like they're super smart and they can like, you know, write your book reports for you. And but you got to keep in mind, like the computer is still at the point where it's basically a toddler. It's like the whole <laughs> terrible two is it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll help you remove these files you don't need. But if you don't spell out every instruction entirely accurately, then it'll just be like, oh, yes, I will gladly delete everything on your hard drive. There's, you know, there's this conception. That actually sounds a lot like my students as well, I feel. <laughs> it is, because, you know, the, the computer, it can, it can do a lot of fancy stuff, but it has no, like a toddler, like it doesn't really understand how the world works. It doesn't understand, like, the pan is hot and you can't touch it. But... I like that analogy. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> um, but that's, I think there's a misconception that like most of software development is like this matrix Neo, like typing stuff into the text editor. And the reality is very little of it is the actual typing. Most of software development is debugging, which is not the fun part. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Every time, every time you write something, you spend like nine times more trying to figure out why it didn't work. It's yeah. not the writing of the code that takes the most time. This is actually, this is exactly what is literally happening in the back row right now. Normally, this seat would be another scientist. I'm sitting here um, because we literally, this is a, you know, this is a new like high tech camera system, and we are actually sitting here doing live debugging of this. We fortunately it's dive number eight or nine or you know whatever, but um, like we we got it working pretty well now. But is that a sponge there on the bottom? You, know, I, you might have just went over it too far. I think I saw one down there in the sand patch, like right below you. I'm not sure if you can get back to it or not. We have the bubble cam as well. Okay, see that one right there. So one lane right there. Uh, you can see it up in the Triclops cam. I guess you can't see it quite in Hercules yet. Oh, kind of weighing down and blending in. Yeah, and he's just starting to see it in the Hercules cam, right in that sand patch rock pebble oh. area. Oh, yeah, I see. It. Yeah. Oh, I see. It right it's kind of a straight one again. Well, that's a really long bamboo coral over there as well. Can you guys explain why we're looking for a dead sponge? I just heard the bosses ask for it. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who has I a good answer. I think we already had that one. We're looking more for more of fan coral or something, you know, different than what they, they just picked up. Simon, is that going to be difficult to get? E yes. Then <laughs> let's just move on. Uh, we already have one. I think we already have uh, that type. So we can continue on, yeah, especially if it's going to be difficult. A little uh, hummocky terrain. I mean, yeah. Be difficult to get a stable platform and reach down. Oh come on, that's a challenge. Not even. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying it's impossible. He asked if it was difficult. I was like, neither, neither did he ask if it was doable. But it's no, no need to put this <laughs> in danger difficult. for that. Yes, let's move on. <laughs> I'm going to put out the 10-minute warning for everyone as well. Yeah. All right, thank you. 10-minute warning.
Simon, what's the most difficult ROV operation you have ever done before? Um, it's a lot of different. Each job prevents it, presents its own challenges. Um, some of the subsea inspections we do of the uh, the oil rigs, the metal structures around there, have offer very limited space to fly the ROV into with um, what we call a uh, cathodic protection probe. So we, we check in order to stop the uh, the structures from rusting. They have um, zinc anodes bolted to them at various places, and we measure the, the relative voltage of those. And trying to fly a very small observation class ROV in the, right in the splash zone of the six meters down in the water, trying to get a a little sharp point onto the head of a bolt is pretty challenging. Um, also, some of the subsea construction stuff. Um, a lot of the science as well can be can be challenging to get the shot that people want and get close to animals and follow them to catch very small jellyfish like we did in the Pacific um, a couple of years ago for sampling. Uh, some of those small little creatures, particularly little uh, polychy worms called swimmers. We chased those around for quite a long time trying to catch them. Um, yeah, then, then other jobs, you know, we have to think um, the Titan sub rescue or salvage that I was on recently presented a lot of challenges on how we'd recover um, certain items that weren't designed to be recovered by ROV. So, yeah, each, each job has its own unique challenges. And it's uh, the most difficult is hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of difficult jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, how about you? What, was, what has been the most difficult ROV operation? Most difficult ROV operation? Yeah. Like task you had to do with the ROV. Um, I think trying to uh, drive Hercules while Robert was using the manipulators to catch a crab that did not want to be caught. <laughs> so trying to maneuver Hercules uh, in one direction while the arm was being driven by another pilot and chasing down a fast moving crab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys manage to catch the crab? We did. We caught the crab and we put it in the in the bio box and, uh, and it came back with us. Nice. Yep. Here is a programming joke. Why do programmers mix up Halloween and Christmas? Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? Why do programmers always mix up Halloween and Christmas? Uh, this is this is probably gonna be like a really cheesy dad <laughs> joke, right? Probably. I don't understand it because I'm not a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, I can't think of any funny guesses. What do we got? Because October 31st equals December 25th. Wait. Okay. So oh, it's you know what oct and dec is. So oct is short for octal, and dec is you know like normal decimal. Uh -huh. So octal like this decimal is like our normal base 10 number system yeah. based upon our fingers, and octal is base eight. Um, yeah. So the number like if you had 25. In our normal base 10, 25 would be 31 in the octal system. Oh. Yeah, that's, uh, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yippity deppity deppity. <laughs> yeah, I did not understand that one at all. So <laughs> yeah, oh. <sighs> Rachel's going to try to think of a better programming joke. <laughs> oh, do you have a better programming joke? No. <laughs> <laughs> we can give you a few and come back. I'm going to have to Google it. <laughs> Going back to 075. We've had a lot of shrimp. Is that a oh. That's a live sponge, right? That one yeah. looked like okay. a live one, yeah.
just uh, came up with one. Okay. Did you hear about why um, Alice, the programmer, uh, didn't make it to lunch today? Alice, the programmer, didn't make it to lunch. Is this going to be like Alice in Wonderland thing? Nope. No. Because she started testing recursion, then she started testing recursion, then she started testing recursion, then she started <laughs> testing recursion, then she started testing recursion, then for testing she started testing recursion, then she started testing recursion. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so the joke is that there's if you have like imagine if you so recursion is basically if you have this like huge number of things, or imagine yeah. you have this like really deeply nested thing. Um, so a recursive function basically oh. keeps calling itself. Okay. So let's say like on, so on our, like our data archives, you know, we have a whole bunch of, you know, everything's organized by like system and instrument, but a lot of times, cause we have so many instruments, you know, you might have like, you know, if you get like an orange drive with Nautilus data on it, there yeah. might be paths that are like 10 directories deep. So the way a recursive function works is that what it'll do is it'll basically like, let's say you had like count files and directory. So every time, so you start at the, you know, the root and then it says, oh, here's a directory. Well, I'm going to call myself again, the same function, but one level down. And so what happens is it, it kicks off all these like pathways where it keeps, you know, it keeps calling itself, but one level down until it finally hits a spot where there's no more like holes that can go down. But in, in, in theory, it's really elegant because, you know, if with a recursive function like that, you know, you can do an arbitrary, you know, deep level of, less, of nesting oh. without, you know, all these complicated for loops. But the issue is if you screw it up, then it'll just keep executing, calling itself forever, and it'll just never end. I don't know. Uh, front row, do we have another scoop? I believe we do, yeah. Do we have time to get a sample here? What, 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 how far are we up to that 10 minute warning? Uh, We're like two minutes? We have about two one, minutes. Two we'll minutes be pushing left. it. All right, then let's not do it. Okay. Yeah. When I'm operating the arms, I do have no concept of time, but I know it's like <laughs> what I think is 30 seconds. Someone says I think the later was like 15 minutes. So it's like <laughs> what? I could be on the Atlanta on your shoulder and be like, come on, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Two minutes is plenty of Two time. Two minutes is plenty. <laughs> I think the craft file takes like a minute to get through <laughs> communication. So, yeah. You guys are pros. You can handle it. <laughs> so you have another Atalanta on your shoulder back there. <laughs> Think of it as a challenge. <laughs> no, that looks like a sponge to me. The white? Yeah. Nav, is it time to come up? Copy, we should. All righty, it's over to you. All right. Uh, yeah, pilots, whenever you're ready. All right. so we we do soon. have a, uh, a f uh, full wrap in the 6.8 tether. Or right not tether, but the 6.8 wire. So. 
yeah, copy that. I'm going to uh, come around and the end the show on that sponge. And everybody, fasten your seatbelts. So we're going to be increasing in altitude and returning to surface. Keep all hands and arms inside the ROV at all times. Indeed. Observe the emergency exits. Do please do not. <laughs> Where are you? All right. Our Herc depth is 1,404 meters and our water temperature is 3.16 degrees Celsius as we start to begin our ascent. So we will keep that chat open and until we're at 50 meters and then we have to turn it off for um, retrieval operations. So this is your last time to get those questions in. Let us know what you want to know about us, or about biology, or ROVs, or computer programming while well, Rachel's still here and we can pester her. Winch, winch control, come up three meters, please. And our chat is letting us know that the last sponge we saw was a Forea sponge. Oh, is that a shrimp right winch, there? Winch control, please come up five meters. You zoom. So, you Dan, what's our shrimp and hmm? cucumber count? Our shrimp count is 34, and Jonathan's cucumber uh, count, brought to you by John's pho photogrammetry, bringing you models of the deep sea since five days ago. <laughs> 3D models on Sketchfab and Centrium, right? So his cucumber count comes to 12. 12. Did we leave the headless chicken monster on there? Did we take that one off? It is on. Does it need to come off? It does need to come off. Then because we are down to 11. Because I think headless chicken, chicken monster is a misnaming of calling it a sea cucumber. It's actually a nudibranch. Yeah, it's called a swimming sea cucumber, but it's not actually a sea cucumber, just to make life a little more difficult. Yeah, that's a, a really bad naming strategy there. Yes. Um, we have a question in the chat. How do you guys keep stuff like computer monitors and lamps not flying around in very rough seas? Well, <laughs> everything is bolted down. So everything is attached. Um, t uh, to the tables, which are bolted, hard bolted into the ground. Even you know, the chairs are kind of hard to move, too, even. Yeah, and every surface is covered in a, like a non-slip non rubber, so that things don't go sliding. Oh, I'm, I'm going to say, too, that I would say this, there's a lot of stuff that's bolted down. Um, there's, 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 there's an overwhelming majority of it is bolted down. Then, d then in descending order of like, oh my God, we just need to get this done. We have a uh, 3M dual lock. That's a very common one. Uh, we've got a lot of Velcro, a lot of zip ties. Um, and yeah, and, and tape, of course, is always good. And that non-stick, like that, these mats, like on, on the table here is non-stick mat. And we have yeah. that on all the desks so the computers don't slide off. like. Bungee cords, ratchet straps. Anything, anything that we can use to keep things in place. Zach, what does your computer say about the headless chicken monster? Is it a sea cucumber? Like because now I'm looking up and it says the class is Holotherian, but I'm also seeing something that says it's a nudibranch, and nudibranchs and sea cucumbers are not the same thing. Definitely not the same thing. Uh, let's see. There's another sea cucumber, so I'm going to add 12 back. <laughs> and then we... We will try to decide on the headless chicken monster. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got something loading here. I'll see what I find. 
I mean, it sounds like it's a single species, though, like within its classification, too, so. Species genes, oh, function. Yeah, because when I look at the taxonomy, it does call it a holotherian, which is a sea cucumber. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the only one of its genus, it sounds like. That's pretty impressive. Um, let's see. All my uh, classification uh, tools and systems I'm used to using are just for the reef, so I gotta dig deeper for this. Yeah, it's weird. Some are calling it a Spanish dancer. That's very yeah. Because some very and I was like, I've seen Spanish dancers before, and I mean, yeah. it, just because it's floating around. Yeah, I don't maybe think people it like mis were like mistaking it for a Spanish dancer for a long time. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Now I see why they call it a headless chicken. <laughs> they put a picture of a of a chicken next to it. I see that now. I guess. I wish we had playback on our cam our systems up here. You know, we could just uh, rewind <laughs> and look at yeah. it again. I did take a picture of it. I'll have to pull it up when I'm going through the captures from this dive later on. Yeah. Oh, it has bioluminescence in it that it uses to fend off predators. That's pretty cool. And it's just a bunch of news articles about someone seeing it once upon a time. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. And they kind of keep using things like sea cucumber, but then they also call it Spanish dancer and then yeah. throwing new to break. So it just, I don't know. It seemed like anyone really. Yeah, I mean, it says phylomechinoderm, holothroidia, yeah. Let's see, let's look through our own Nautilus, because I know we've seen one in the past. So our archives call it a sea cucumber. Yeah, seems as if. I guess you can put it back on the on the uh, sea cucumber count there, Dan. <laughs> That's what really matters. All right, Dan, would you like to give our viewers... Oh, look at that. Another uh, shrimp. A day shrimp. shrimp. Big shrimp. Some long antennas on that dude. Oh, you can really nice view of the swimmerettes there. Dan, would you like to give us a dive recap? Sure. So, um, I think this dive's been going on for about 10 hours now. Uh, we came down at uh, essentially a nice level plateau midway up the seamount. It ended up being pretty sandy bottom. Um, worked our way up a slight slope uh, to a little point and then back down and explored that valley for a little bit. And then we started to work our way up essentially, if you imagine the seamount as a mountain, you know, you have the ridges and the valleys. So we started to work our way up the valleys and investigating. Um, any uh, coral or, uh, you know, geology and just, you know, what, what areas are here. Uh, we've been taking photogrammetry the whole time and we've been processing it. So I just saw a nice uh, snippet of the, essentially the ascent up as we went up through. So 
that's being done in almost real time. So a couple hours later, you know, it takes about an hour or so to get enough uh, photos. So every hour or so we're chunking and, and moving uh, the photogrammetry as we move up the slope. And um, then essentially came to the top, did a couple samples. We grabbed the uh, um, uh, uh, sediment to see exactly what, how old this is and characterize geology. Uh, grabbed a coral sample, uh, see what's going on with that, and it was a dead one. We're not taking live, you know, uh, coral. And now we're just uh, then kind of moved to go up the ridge to take a look at that to see how the coral density is. And we ran out of time, so now we're ascending up. <coughs> Bless you. Excuse me. So as we ascend up, you know, we'll be downloading photos off of the ROV, and data team will be working late night to stitch all this together. Sure will. So I'm not sure how far we came, but, you know, probably like a kilometer. Yeah, this will be the longest one we have yet, for sure. Yeah. We look to see how far. So where are we at on the waypoints? So a little over two kilometers, it looks like, is where we've gone. So this will be the longest photogram tree. Um, transect that we had up a seamount. Good test of the technology. Yeah. Mike and Simon, we have a couple questions for you in the chat. Um, so at Atlanta, altitude is controlled by the winch, right? So how are the two thrusters mounted and what directions do they control? Sorry, one. so we have, uh, there's two thrusters on Ad Atalanta, one on the front and one on the rear, um, essentially pointing in opposite directions, so they provide a heading only um, option. So as, the, uh, as Hercules flies around, Atalanta can spin and keep an eye on it, and then we have a tilt camera on board that um, yeah, allows us to, to follow Hercules as she moves through the water column. And then what is the tether made out of that's so strong? Is it Kevlar? There is Kevlar in it, yeah. So uh, we have the, the power conductors, uh, essentially copper wires inside, and we have a, a stainless steel tube that contains the, the fiber optic um, fibers. And uh, that's all wrapped by an insulated uh, plastic cover. And then around that is usually uh, woven Kevlar and then an, an extra um, layer on top of that to add insulation and uh, waterproof sealed uh, yeah on top of that pretty much neutrally buoyant in water so, and well i don't think everyone got to share out what they wanted to be when they were younger. So Mike, what did you want to be when you were younger? What did you want to grow up to do? Uh, I wanted to be a shark biologist. Oh, shark biologist. Yeah. Got to be a shark biologist for for a number of years. Oh yeah? What kind of sharks were you studying? Uh, I worked with tiger sharks, Galapagos sharks, uh, white tip and black tip reef sharks. And what made you transition over from that? Uh, the ability to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> Pay the bills. <laughs> Pay the bills. <laughs> yeah. That's why I became a teacher. But Although I don't think I had yeah. still not making any money, so yeah. not very, the smartest choice. Very rewarding work, uh, but yeah, also uh, not, not much pay in it. Dave, how about you? What did you want to be when you were a child? An astronaut. Oh, an astronaut. Yep. I grew up uh, in the space program. My dad worked uh, for Boeing in aerospace, and uh, I wanted to wanted to be an astronaut. They were my heroes. The original uh, Mercury astronauts, Gemini astronauts, Apollo astronauts, on, on through. Someone in the chat is asking, what is our dive number? And this is H2018. One nine. Oh, it is one nine? Yeah. Our board is out yeah, of date then. Yeah, today's so one nine. It is two zero one nine. 
That didn't make an eye. That did not help. <laughs> there you go, yeah. Close enough. And then Simon, what did you want to be when you were little? Uh, when I was little, I, I always wanted to join the, the Royal Air Force. And that you did my, that? Yep, that was my calling, so to speak. I spent four years in the Air Cadets prior to, prior to joining. Um, didn't quite know what I wanted to do. I ended up being a mechanic, which wasn't really on the list of things that I wanted to do. <laughs> kind of descended from from pilot to electrical engineer to to something else. But uh, yeah, I was I ended up with a good career. Being a mechanic is a very good career. It I was, and I did some <laughs> some very varied work from uh, working in a cryogenic plant making liquid oxygen to oh, working cool. on ground, um, surface to air defense missile systems to. Uh, jet engines, pneumatics, so hydraulics, you, yeah, all sorts. So do you get a benefit plan that you can get yourself cryogenically frozen later on in life? Uh, <laughs> no, I get the, the, the British military is a little not, not very generous in that regard. I, <laughs> I have been a pensioner since the age of 35, though, so. <laughs> Zach, what did you want to be when you were a child? Um... I mean, growing up, sports was my life growing up, oh, especially yeah. in the Midwest, what everybody was. So I always, you know, dreamed of that. But outside of sports, it was always wanted to be a marine scientist. And then, yeah, yeah once I went to school and became one, I really didn't know what that meant and what I was supposed to do after. <laughs> and I think I just kind of fell back into naturally kind of like the the, the farming life in terms of like the ocean, though. So yeah. I, I went into aquaculture for a while doing research with that. But realized that wasn't really what I wanted to do when I was a marine as a marine scientist so yeah in the last couple of years kind of found my way back more towards what I want to be doing such as working with things like Nautilus and the mega lab that I'm in um, so yeah I remember when this when uh, Nautilus first came out and seeing it and thinking well wow, you know that's the type of like marine science you know you want to be a part of things so yeah pretty surreal being here um, with this but just in general yeah being back in like the marine science realm I hope to be um, yeah it's it, it's a um, yeah pretty rewarding yeah. but yeah after becoming it was interesting because i always had that goal and then once i hit it i didn't know what the next goal was yeah <laughs> so it took me a couple of years to figure out what what that meant to actually do now but yeah dan how about yourself oh i'm living my dream job <clears throat> oh. i always wanted to be a scientist when i grew up um but you know what is it that made you want to become a scientist when you're a child? I just, you know, I wanted to find the things I didn't know. So, you know, like the things that really drove me was like MacGyver. Okay. When, you know, growing up, oh, yeah. But MacGyver's not really like a scientist. Yeah, he but just he, like... He knew all the science. Like, you know, he knew how to make stuff out of, you know, what, what kind of guy can take a, you know, a, you know, bubble gum and a knife and a couple chemicals and next thing you know, he's got a, you know, He's got a bomb or a rocket and jumping <laughs> over the moon. I mean, you know, that guy was, like, amazing. Or, like, you know, Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool. Archaeologist. That was, you know, when I was really young, as, like, a five-year-old watching that and being like, wow. Look at how much he knows and discovering things. I and wonder then, how many people went into archaeology because of Indiana Jones. And then it was yeah. like, this is not actually Indiana Jones. <laughs> and then I remember, I remember a show called Sequest. That was when I was really young, uh, growing up, and that was kind of cool because it was all about, a, a, you know, this submarine that went through the water, and all these cool technologies that didn't exist at the time. So that was one of the things that really inspired me to go underwater. Was that that show there? Okay. Well, someone from the chat is coming in with an ID from Chris Ma for the funny looking urchin that was seen during the earlier watch, Taylor Ann's watch, and said that it's possibly a heart urchin in the genus Priosgythus, but the spines seem to have barnacles on them. So if anyone remembers that from earlier.
our current depth right now is 1,185 meters, and we're at 3.73 degrees Celsius. So, Rachel, since you're back, do you want to give us a brief explanation of photo photogrammetry for everyone who didn't catch it at the very beginning? Sure, absolutely. Um, so the biggest, you know, the there's a massive amount of really heavy-duty number crunching that, uh, that, you know, goes into the actual process. But the, the easiest way to explain it is to, it's basically the depth perception that your brain does for you. So, you know, generally speaking, we've got uh, two eyes that are located a little bit apart from each other. So, you know, if you close your left eye, you see a slightly different image from, you know, if you close your other eye, you know, I can see like if I put my finger out in front of me and I, you know, left eye versus right eye, you know, I can, that gives me a different perspective on it. Um, and, you know, if I open both of my eyes and I, you know, hold my finger out and move it back and forth, I can tell how far away, roughly how far away that object is. Uh, and if I put out two fingers, you know, one at one foot and the other two feet apart, I can say, oh, you know, my left hand is about a foot behind where my right, or my right hand's about a foot behind from where my left hand is. Um, so photogrammetry is basically taking something that our brain does naturally, and it's giving the, like, toddler level, you know, intelligence computer all the mathematical instructions to say, oh, okay, well, you have two cameras, and they're, you know, they're offset by a certain distance so that the cameras themselves have depth perception. And you're looking at a scene from two slightly different perspectives. So if you, you know, so what the, so what that is going to give you is it's going to give you the relative alignment of, and the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, you need two cameras that are offset by some distance but you also need to have an absolute perspective, right? Because even, even if I just, you know, look at, you know, if I hold my fingers out and I'm looking at them, that tells me where I am in a relative space. This, you know, my left hand is a foot in front of my face, and my right hand's two feet in front of my face. But that's not giving me an absolute position that, you know, would translate to coordinates on the planet. So, like, right now, um, we're doing, well, we have done some photogrammetry surveys on HERC, and we've got, you know, we've got two cameras that are recording images, but so that will, if we run our the program we've been using is called Reality Capture. So the two cameras themselves are going to give us the relative orientation of features. But in order to turn those into actual, you know, useful, geographically meaningful models, we need to tie in, we need to take those relative positions and we need to link them back to reality. So, like, right now, uh, Hercules is at, what is that, 18.812 uh, and a bunch of other numbers degrees north. And we are at uh, minus 157.06 and then a bunch of other numbers uh, west. So when we put all this together, then the photogrammetry is, you know, we have our position of our vehicle, what we call a flight log, which is the actual absolute point in space that it's tracing over time. And then we've got our images and it's saying, oh, okay, well, you know, here's the relative position the, of the features that we take from the cameras and the, you know, the photogrammetry, finger quotes, depth perception. And then it's going to link it back to where the vehicle actually was. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, uh, what, what the, the computer program is cesium? Um. So there's, um, so there's a couple, um, so the actual process of, of, um, Aligning the images and doing the the depth perception component that is uh, reality capture, yeah, yeah. and then cesium is the tool we actually use to display the models. Yeah, because that that geolocates it in the Earth. Mm -hmm. So now you can go any you know say okay where was in the Earth and you know links to Google I think it links to Google Earth so that you know exactly where you're at where these models are captured. Yeah. So that's really cool that the fact that you take these models and then you combine it with another program. And now you know exactly where things are at, and orientation, and the scale. So you can zoom in, zoom out, and you realize just how small of the area winch, of the ocean winch, we covered. But it's really really high resolution. to 27 yeah. meters per minute. So what it, do you know what the, you know what the resolution that we're getting is? Is it you know, an inch resolution? So the, uh, the, so the imagery itself is going to be, so where's the, our 
individual cameras. You know, so we're we're acquiring images at at 6K. Uh, so that means you have 6,000 pixels uh, horizontally, and so the the probably the minimum feature size that we could resolve, I think, would be probably like centimeter scale. Centimeter, okay. Because the um, I mean the the so the cameras themselves can see extremely fine detail. Um, the biggest thing sources of error would be uncertainty and um say herx motion um okay. we're we're getting image, images every three seconds but you know our vehicle's moving slightly so the you know the what we can see optically versus what we can actually make mathematically meaningful i think the the greater limitation comes from the uncertainty in our position rather than any you know any sort of optical limits um and there's actually there's a couple real kind of interesting and unexpected problems we've run into. Um, the first is that it's actually, it's a lot easier to do g uh, photogrammetry on the surface or in the air because, you know, so GPS, like if you have like a drone, like I get a DJI and I'm flying around like looking at a farm or I'm doing, uh, you know, surveying a building or something, um, GPS at this point is really, really high resolution. But the issue is that those uh, radio signals don't actually work underwater. So uh, underwater, we've got to use acoustic systems. And the system we're using now is called the USBL. Called a short baseline. Yep. yep. And that's, it's kind of like underwater GPS, except for it uses sound instead of, uh, instead of, you know, radio waves. But the... Um, and that's not as accurate. Nope. It's, um, and there's actually, and there's, and there's a couple challenges we run into. Uh, the first is that so the whole ultra, the, so the USBL in ultra short is that the, what we're really doing is we're triangulating. So, you know, if you GPS on the surface, you have, well, first off, you might have like a GPS receiver is going to usually lock on to like ten, nine or ten different actual satellites, and those are spaced very far apart. But the issue is that on the USBL, you only have two receivers, and they're actually very close together. So if you draw the whole actual triangulation process out, um, you know, with a GPS or a GPS, or the, and there's other systems than GPS. The European Un Union has one, Russia has one, China has one. The nice thing about those is that you've got probably nine, ten, maybe even eleven different satellites, and you're able to do your triangulation with all of these. Whereas, you know, with a USBL system, you only have two points, and you don't have that really long. Uh, distance between so the so the difference in the angle you have this super narrow triangle coming in and then so you've got error in position there um, and the you know to get this kind of and k2 is much more of an expert on, on this than I am but one of the ways you can try and improve the accuracy is by taking your information from one system like USBL and then um, compensate, you know, and, and using another system. Like there's a thing called an inertial navigation system. And if you have something that can synth synthesize all those inputs together, it helps you filter out some of the errors that might show up just using USBL. Yeah, just to make it more complicated, time, <laughs> is, not time is not standard either. Yeah. Because, you know, with GPS, you get a time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but now with, with acoustics, time, you know, sound, sound travels very differently depending on the uh, temperature of the water. So, you know, you don't even know, reliably know what time the signal was sent and when it was received. So yeah. that's another source error. Yeah, and there's, um, so any any time, because the nice thing about the atmosphere is that the atmosphere itself is a relatively consistent, you know, there's, so there's minor variations in say clouds, warm air, yeah. but those variations are minor compared to the variations we see across the water column. And, um, Anytime we're, so when we're doing sonar mapping, we actually have to get uh, a profile, a sound velocity profile. And fortunately, HERC does have a CTD, so we are able to get the, uh, we could think we could probably do a sound velocity profile from the underway CTD. Okay. Um, but the issue you run into is that on a long dive, you know, if you've moved a lot, it changes. You're, yes. Yeah, I mean, the underway CTD can only measure where you are right now. So if you, you know, if you dive and you, you know, you have a, as you're going down to the water column, you, know, you might have hit all those thermoclines like 
12 hours or 18 hours ago, and you, the ship may have moved a considerable degree since then. But, yep. but actually, the so there's the so there's the really kind of meaty challenge of getting a really accurate position underwater. And then one of the other issues we ran into on the data visualization side was actually kind of a almost like a you know like a stupid problem and a lot of things that are meant for visualizing 3D geospatial data don't handle negative depth well. Oh, cuz you um you think about you know you're doing a photogrammetry survey of like a like a building for construction. Yep. Well, the whole building is above the surface of the earth. But right now, you know, like for a lot of these dives, you might be a thousand meters or two thousand meters down. Yeah. So we found that 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 whole negative depth was. They don't like negative depth. Though. No. Interesting. And um, and from like the the data analysis programming side, there's a l um a lot of times depth data, it might be recorded as negative or positive. So somebody might say, oh, well, you know, your, your altitude is minus, you know, 1,000, or your depth is plus 1,000. And if half of your data, if your sign convention's different, then trying to go back and correlate all of this is a total nightmare. This just goes back to what you're saying, is it's not just the programming, it's making sure all the inputs align. Yeah. Um, big, part of, big part of programming and making things work. Input validation and debugging. Yeah, there's even for, you know, I was reading off a couple uh, latitudes and longitudes before, but there's, what's up? Oh, okay. Oh, whoops. Thank you. Did you just break it? I, uh, I may have brushed off a couple, our columnar basalts, we lost a couple <laughs> basalts. Um, but yeah, even for coordinates, so there's two different systems. There's reporting decimal coordinates which is, you know, uh, minus 115.123456. But then there's also reporting them in degrees, minutes, and seconds. And uh, the degrees, minutes, seconds, that's more of like a traditional, you know, maritime, like on the bridge, you know, you're charting. Yep. Um, whereas decimal is more like what we're looking at in the van here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. That was a great explanation. <laughs> I love I, I love going in detail with you. That's yeah. <laughs> we can yeah we can we can happy to, to go deep into these you know the, how it all works. I'm sure together. The, I'm sure the viewers are loving this. <laughs> um, so for the viewers for our plans so tomorrow is actually there's not going to be a dive tomorrow. We're going to do a personnel transfer, but make sure you stay in tune on Tuesday, because Tuesday I think it's going to be some pretty exciting dive. We're going to head on over to the Loihi Seamount and see some hydrothermal vents. So today we were on very old land, 82 million years old. Yep, and now we're going to go over to some brand new This will be brand new stuff coming out. Yeah. Only, what? Only years old. <laughs> yeah, um, about a couple of years ago, there was actually, there was a NASA and Nautilus collaboration on Loihi. It was called Subsea. And it was, uh, it was NASA's sort of like, like operations, you know, mission controlling people. Uh, and the experiment they did was they wanted to figure out, you know, when we're talking about future planetary exploration efforts, you know, you're not going to be able to send scientists because, you know, you can only fit, the I mean, same thing as a ship, you can only fit so many people. So, you know, you definitely need a pilot and you definitely need uh, technicians and engineers and mechanics to actually make the thing run. Um, but, you know, for, for space exploration, like you're just, you're probably, it's very unlikely you're going to get all of the experts in the geology and the, you know, the scientific disciplines out there. So the purpose of the subsea project was to have all of your scientific experts on shore and have to communicate with the onboard mission team. And all of the chat, all of the audio was recorded so that they could figure out, you know, when they, when they write their, their mission plans, then, oh, okay, this is how this mission will actually play out. And the, the feature they were exploring was actually Loihi Seamount. Oh. oh. And I think at the time we actually had, we got video of 
the actual lava flows coming out and, and cooling and, and hitting the seawater and a whole bunch of steam. And oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah. It was, um, I think, yeah, the project was called Subsea. So if you look through the OET archives, there's some, uh, some really interesting stuff there. It's definitely the dive that I've been really looking forward to the most out of this whole expedition. I'm excited to go see some hydrothermal vents. Well, I know years ago there was active eruptions going on. Yeah. I don't know if they're still going on. There was an eruption not too long ago. I mean, they're on and off. Oh, no. And so, um, yeah. Last year around December time, they actually had Mauna Loa and... Um, Oh, why am I blanking on the other one now? It's not Zach, Mauna Loa, and what's the other volcanic crater? Uh, uh, Kilauea. Or Kilauea. There we go. Mauna, Mauna Loa and Kilauea were both erupting around the beginning of December last year, and since then, Kilauea's kind of had another little eruption here and there. Um, yeah, Kilauea kind of like opens up at the top every once in a while. You'll see the glow and everything. Yeah, in the crater. Not, and so yeah. when we say eruption, it's not like it's yeah. blowing its top and spewing yeah. lava everywhere. The Lately, it's been kind of been centered just in the caldera in Kilauea. Yeah. Mauna yeah. Loa, though, was coming out the side there for a bit last yeah. year. And so... Um, I yeah, Mauna Loa out. was a little bit of the scary one because it could have gone any direction. And, yeah, we weren't uh, there sure. There wasn't many places you were safe until the lava stopped flowing. And there's um, a main road that goes across the island. The saddle. Kine, saddle. Yeah, and it was within a couple miles of that. And that, yeah, if uh, that road had been lost, it would have been quite interesting because the other roads aren't aren't um, as well maintained, aren't as new. So they, the traffic builds up much quicker on those roads. They're all one lane, basically. So... Yeah, I was very lucky that uh, Mauna Loa didn't cross the saddle road, but... So I um, decided to come over to try and see that eruption, yeah. and I had a, arranged for a helicopter to go over the lava oh, and yeah. see it. But of course, the day before I got here is when it stopped. Ah, <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. I, I have had, I have come over to the big island and yeah. seen and gotten very close to lava, so it's... Yeah, on the and previous expedition er, um, eruption, I, I did the helicopter thing too, and yeah. it was raining that day, and all it was was just smoke everywhere underneath us. You couldn't see well, anything. Well, and, and it's, it's like pretty dangerous for because when it rains and it hits the lava, it creates a lot of noxious, poisonous gas. Yeah. Oh. So yeah. it's definitely better seeing it from a distance on your feet for me. Well, I would imagine that in about 24 hours, we'll find out if there's any active eruptions at Loihi. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to it as well. Yeah, so our dive plan is, um, I think, similar to our timing on today's, right? Starting at 9 a.m. and, you know, and then ending around 8 p.m., but always give or take depending on weather and technical difficulties and whatnot, so... We shall see. So we're doing a personnel transfer tomorrow and then transiting over towards the other side of the Big Island, towards Loihi. Mm -hmm. Those uh, those at sea personnel transfers, like those are, you know, those are pretty fun to be yeah, involved in. Yeah, get a little ride in the Zodiac over. Always, you know, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, I only ever got to do one once because I, I usually end up, like, on the whole yeah. cruise. But I got to do one once, and it was, of course, like, we did it at night, so it's oh, all... Oh, at night, that even adds a whole other layer to it. Well, it's all, I mean, the whole thing is, like, it's it's all, like, it's like Navy SEALs, you know, you're... I mean, you got, like, the Zodiac <laughs> or on the... You know, you've got, like, you're, like, climbing up and down ladders, and there's, like, cranes and stuff. I mean, like, this is, there's no... We were going on to um, some. Oh, we we're going on to a larger vessel because yeah. we had to offload like pallets of stuff. But it was it was pretty awesome. I would highly recommend the. I mean, the really crazy in like the offshore, you know, construction world. They'll actually yeah. do like helicopter personnel transfers. I've never yeah, done one of those. I've but, done those before. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I've yeah. done helicopter transfers. <laughs> so what are they like? They're fun. Huh? I mean, yeah, I was on big seismic vessels in the Gulf of Mexico. Like the bathroom actually even had heated floors. These, these were 
big ships. They're nice. Um, one's, one of them, the, a lot of the crew was French, so we had a French pastry chef on board even. <laughs> yeah. But not all of them were that level, so I've been on really nice ones and some not so nice ones. But yeah, yeah you take the helicopter on over and you land on the ship and it's it's pretty fun they make you wear all this helicopter safety equipment i had to go through boziet helicopter training on how to escape the helicopter if it crashes and all that so they make you go in the pool yeah you have to you yeah. you you get put in the pool in this helicopter simulator and then they flip the simulator up and you have to like escape it and they Turn the lights off and all that stuff. So yeah, that's pretty fun. I've done that a few times. Yeah, I've done it. Yeah, yeah. it cost. It's expensive though for that training. So it it cost me a pretty penny, oh, but it, I, I was able to write it off on my taxes. So. Oh. First one. But well, this ship seems pretty easy. Like the gangway goes all the way down <laughs> to get off when we did the other personnel transfer. Yeah. And I think it's, especially the, you know, like most of the screws is, is pretty coastal. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's really easy. You know, you get the Zodiac right up there. Um, it's pretty level, nothing, nothing too crazy. So Rachel, here's a question in the chat for you. They said that they really enjoy the photogametry, but their true love is the stereo photography, the 3D for the eyeballs. Where might they be able to find the raw-ish stereo imagery from NA-156? Um, is it available on the ONR website, or do they need to discover Jonathan's secret email address at OET? I think we're going to have to get back to you on that. we gotta, we got to figure out where it's... So this is, this is our first, like, you know, science crews using the system. Um, but so there's a lot of new data workflows for it. Uh, we do, there actually is an official like OET data request um, process where, you know, we can, um, we can figure out like, you know, the, the invoicing because this, I mean, this set, it's big enough, it'll have to get delivered on like a, a hard drive. Okay. Um, there is an, there is an official OET data request process. Um, for this, in terms of archiving this, that is still something we've got to <laughs> figure out. <laughs> One it's, step at a time. <laughs> well, because it's also because this is not really, you know, the, the issue we run into with new technology like this is that there are official repositories of science data, but, you know, there's no real pathway for this kind of imagery we have we have standard processes for video and what we'll probably do is this will be archived in the same way that all of the like the raw prores you know the the cruise videos archived but on um, a lot of the things like like folder structure and things like that are still being figured out um i think that's that sounds, that sounds like a problem for like a couple of weeks after the end of this cruise <laughs> I'm, I think we're just we're gonna put it all on a hard drive and we'll mix put some on tapes and I'm gonna like go home and like take a couple days off and then <laughs> we'll we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> so sounds like yes, you do have to discover Jonathan's secret email address. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll you know we'll 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 figure it out. <laughs> to be determined, or maybe figure out Rachel's secret email address. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> this is, this is, I'm very much feeling like this kind of, this, this is a delegation problem. Yeah. <laughs> delegation this, this problem. is going to be, we're going to, we're going to get the interns right on that. <laughs> Do you know how many interns OET employees or internship opportunities? I know that, so if you want to apply for internships, you can go to nautiluslive.org. I think the internships and the teacher fellowship applications are gonna open here pretty soon. But yeah, do you know how many they actually have? So it's usually, um, so basically, so most of the like formal departments on board will usually have one intern per cruise, but the but the internships they rotate, so it's not you know you're not necessarily going to be the intern like for the entire year. Yeah. Um, we have actually because I know I we have a video intern, 
ROV intern. We've got our nav map intern, Johan, right over there. Yes. Who's uh, in the middle of recovery planning. But, yeah. Yep. Alrighty, folks. Uh, also, yeah, there's basically the, I, I'm going to go help with yeah. recovery. But um, basically, most of the departments have one, and there's a rotation of interns throughout the, throughout the field season. Um, video, nav map, and um, ROV. And whether they want to or not, deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, like, listen, like, I am, like, part of the professional staff, and I'm also <laughs> helping out with deck operations. So th that's just a rite of passage. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to put it in the water and you want to, you yeah. got to take it out and you got to, you know, do your taglines. So in about half an hour, y'all can watch me probably cook an air tugger on the port side. <laughs> All right. Thank it's you, Rachel. You did a great job again explaining all the technical stuff to the viewers out there. I appreciate it. All right. Have fun at the deck. Thank you. Thank make, you, Dan. Make sure Dan you get it back on board safely. Science generally has an intern. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought science as, had uh, one as well. As well as yeah. uh, video. That's me. And ROV. <laughs> and then uh, uh, usually three SCFs. Yes, Four. three science SCFs. Um, so three science FCS, SCFs, one science, one video, one ROV, and one nav. Is that right, Dave? That's correct. Dave? You're seven. <laughs> seven, okay. Per cruise. Per cruise. And is it usually 12 or 13 cruises per year? Uh, I don't know. Give or take? <laughs> Something like Depending that. Depending on? Ten. Ten. I know not all the expeditions this year had SCFs on board. Uh, that's correct. Because yes. I think like the last two do not have SCFs, but there's communication fellows, so they still do ship right. to shore interactions. You still have person in the comm seat, but it's not science communication fellows like myself. Yeah, we did. You know, we did uh, uh, th three weeks worth of work for ONC, and that was all their personnel. So I don't, there weren't any interns on that. So we're coming up on 500 meters. Yep, 500 meters, and our temperature is 6.48 degrees Celsius. So did you enjoy the shrimp count? Yeah, what is our final shrimp count? Oh, our final shrimp count. Did I you add, we, we needed to add back that headless chicken. It is, it a, really CQ. is, a, it is a sea cucumber, Alrighty. yes. Alrighty. So, so we'll put it back on the count. We had 35 shrimp. 35 shrimp. 35 shrimp. And Jonathan's cucumber count, sponsored by Jonathan's photogrammetry, turns out to be now 13 when 13. you add that back in. Okay. So I 12 regular and one special. Does, does it, yeah, I was going to say, does a headless chicken monster count as extra sea cucumbers? We'll give it 10. It still doesn't make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> still can't compete with the shrimp. Yeah. It, Makes sense. It, it was there for a little bit trying. So when is whale migration season? So... Whale migration season, we're coming up on it. Um, it's never a definitive time. Whales tend to keep their own schedule. But I think in, in November is usually a good safe time that they start to come into. December is really starts to be strong into it. And then they stay around till spring before they head on back up to Alaska to feed. So they come down here, have their babies, nurse them, um, mate as well. So gestation for the whales is a pretty long gestation period. So they come down here to mate, and then they return to have their calves because there's less predators. One of the biggest predators for humpback whales are your orcas. And oh. so we don't really have orcas here, so it's a safer kind of territory for them. We do have sharks, but we don't have great whites as much. They do come down, but they're a lot rarer, and great whites will 
usually migrate down here if they smell a dead whale. That's what usually will bring in the great whites. But for the most part, you know, we get we do have some tiger sharks and things like that. But they're not usually um, a problem for grown whales. But Thank you. The biggest the biggest predators for whales are the the orcas. orcas. Yeah. Especially babies. Especially babies. Like Calves. I've actually, when I was in Alaska, um, I saw a pod of killer whales take down a humpback whale, and is one of those brutal, like, you know, you're like, I can't yeah. watch, but I can't stop watching kind of things. You know, the orcas will actually, like, jump onto and hit and drown because the the humpback whales, wow. the baby humpback whales, yeah. Yeah, orcas are very strategic. They are. They're moves. they're it very is, smart. It is no hoping something works. It's a calculation with them, yeah. And they teach each other. Yeah. Like they they learn, they teach, and they remember. Yeah, there's a lot of videos out there you can find of like the adults teaching the the young ones how, and it, it looks like they're just like teasing the food, you know, like with yeah. seals and stuff. Oh and yeah, it's just when like I was on fishing boats, oh. we'd see. Um, You'd pull up a line of halibut, and it'll just be like just lips. They can know how to pick the fish off yeah. the hooks, and all they leave are lips. And like they, you, and they know like you can have like bycatch of other species of fish, but they'll only pick the ones they want. So they, yeah, they're very smart. I also read something where they're now like attacking sailboats. Have you read that? <laughs> I have heard of that. Um, it's only off of the coast of like Spain and Portugal, oh, okay. the Iberian Peninsula, that this is happening. And the science community is kind of split on why they're doing it. So the two most prevailing hypotheses is one, they think it's fun. It's like be shown like you know, it's just something to do, I guess. And then the other hypothesis is that it's revenge, oh. that a whale got hit by a propeller, because it seems like on these boats, too, they're only, they're only targeting, I think it's the propeller, or is it the prop? I haven't, I haven't seen it. Uh, no, maybe it's the prop or something that, a part of the ship, and that they've, uh, an orca had been struck by it, remembered that it got hit by a boat, and so is now attacks that and so it's taught the other orcas huh. to attack the ships and so it seems to be kind of isolated to a pod and in this one area too so there there have been a lot of videos circling circulating out there about that and a lot of theories so kind of interesting wow yeah you're you're full of information I've, out I think that's because you've been all over the place. I have been a lot of places, but I feel when I'm on Nautilus, I feel like I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the only place in the world you can swim with orcas, if anyone wants to go swimming with orcas, is in Norway. Norway? And yes, and actually it just started right now. This is a season because the herring are migrating. So if you go to the northern part of Norway... You can swim with orcas. Seems to be cold. Take yeah, you have suit. to wear a dry suit. <laughs> a dry suit. You okay. do have to wear a dry suit. So I have not done that yet. It's on my bucket list. I know someone who's a guide up there. Oh. It does orca tours. Takes people out. Um, but yeah, I need to save some money up because I spent all my money this summer. So. <laughs> so now to like what January February. Uh, no, I don't think it lasts that long. No, just, just it's, November, it's just, December. It's right now, yeah. Right it's now. like kind of, yeah, November, December, maybe January. Wow. But it's based off the herring season. So the herring bring the orcas in closer to land. Aha. Uh -huh. I don't know, after hearing what Zach tells me, I don't know if I want to swim with orcas. Oh, I would swim with orcas in a heartbeat. Ah. Uh, I don't know. We're too big to eat. <laughs> There's been no known killing of a human in the wild by orcas. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, in the wild. I 
Anything on the chat? It's been very quiet. It has been quiet. Although they weren't that quiet when I accidentally said that the headless chicken monster was an icy cucumber. I got oh. a lot of comments about that mistake. <laughs> We're here to be humbled. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you make a mistake, the chat will let you know. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's good to have excellent viewers that, you know. <laughs> yes. None of the technical details. And definitely very good at helping us with our ID IDs, too. So we appreciate you, viewers. We have technologists on this cruise, mostly. So yeah. I'm sure they have biology and geologists that know all this stuff. Oh, so the chat is letting us know they're going after the rudders. The it rudders. is the rudders. Oh. Yeah. The rudder. Then they can't steer. Yeah, that's the thing. Is like so they take out the rudder. Just immobilize. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I imagine it kind of like Jaws. It takes out the rudder, and then next you know it keeps popping in. You know. How many cases are there of this? Oh, that I don't know. One time, and now everybody's worried. I think Look it's been fish, it's been more than shrimp. one time. It's definitely been more than one time. It's happened several. There's quite a few YouTube videos now circulating on it. Oh. Um, I haven't been staying completely up to date on it. Yeah. I haven't, so I don't know if it's still on. I think it's still ongoing. I, you know, sometimes news stories like this also get blown out of proportion as well. Like they get yeah. sensationalized. So it starts to be t hard to tell the different truth from fact sometimes. Yeah. All right, our current depth is 306 meters, and we are at 9.8 degrees Celsius. Today I'm seeing many more like shrimp or small like living animals in the in the mid-water column. Yeah, we had a, a quite a few little fish. I wonder if we'll get inked again tonight. There hasn't well, been a night yet we didn't, right? I think, I think one. we've won one night. One, one night. night. But we also are in a different location, much farther from Yeah, there. we got inked last night, though, and we're in the same location oh, as yeah, last night. Oh, yeah, that is true. That is true. All right, so chat, feel free to write in any questions you have. You won't be able to hear from us tomorrow. So any dying, burn, burning questions? <laughs> Zach, on the Big Island, where do you think your must-see things are? Must go to places on Man, I'm not a good person to ask right now as a grad student. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> doing anything. I've just been in school for the last two years. Have you uh, gone to the Green Sand Beach? Yep, been down there. So it's quite a hike. Yeah, so you can get to the Green yeah. Sand Beach by two ways. You can walk it, which is, a, or there are people that you can pay some locals and you get a truck ride to it and back. Yeah. I recommend actually walking it because. At the actual beach, it's really beautiful, but I think yeah. it's, you have a lot of other colors mixed into the sand. Yeah. Whereas if you walk it, there's lots of little nooks and crannies and you can find some super pure green sand along yeah. the way. If you kind of take your time, explore the little coasts along the way, so. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not sure what the reason is that it all accumulates down there. It's all a bunch of olivine, but I don't know what you know, makes the olivine down there? It'd be a good question for for a geologist, but um, yeah, Where's I Where's Dr. Mara when you need him? It, it's a, I know that the green I th is from because of the lividine um, from the volcanoes. That's why we have green sand beach. Is mm. It's probably a difference so. in density. Yeah. It, you know, I could see that too, down. yeah, because of how much it grades down. And yeah, the, to be honest, so you can pretty much find green sand like all throughout 
the east, like it's in all the beaches, basically, like mixed in. It's yeah, just, mixed in, but it's like the concentration. Down. I don't have the patience to tweezer it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you I want the, nature to a, separate it for us. If you're if you on a black sand, you'll see it. It stands out a lot of the black sand. <laughs> uh, Maui has a red sand beach that's a really beautiful beach. as well, yeah. Um, the viewers have a very important question that they would like us to answer. Us uh, about ice cream sundae. Do we get scoops on a cone, a scoops in a dish? How many flavors? Is it available all day or just a small time window? <laughs> you only get it after dinner, so I guess it's a small time window. So, I mean, it's out the entire time dinner is out. So we have dinner from 5 to 6. Um, I only, when us here on watch, we only have half hour, so I had to, like, scarf, I scarfed my dinner down, but then I had to wait in line for the ice cream, and then... I had to like scarf, I like gave myself brain freeze because yeah. of how fast I had to, was trying to get back up here on top. So the pro tip is to eat ice cream while everybody else is waiting in line for dinner. I think, I think that's <laughs> it. Uh, I think I need to do it the just reverse is eat my ice cream first. Just saying. And I then, so words of wisdom over here. I just learned yesterday we have cookies at three o'clock that I've How did you not know that? I just, I just well, went it's downstairs and never came up to my watch and then. It's not always yeah. cookies. It's a Some baked, type of bakery yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. My roommate was telling me yesterday, he's like, oh man, the cookies and milk were so good. And I had I, no idea what he was talking about. I was half an hour late. And all the cookies were gone today, yeah. so really? I was like, wow. I was like, whatever they gave today's snack must have been yeah. really good because it was gone. I still miss today. I decided to take my first nap of the trip. <laughs> Slept right through cookies again. <laughs> I well, that's why I was half an hour late. I was taking a nap up on the monkey deck before shift yeah. started. I was grading all day today, and then it's like I'm gonna go sit outside and enjoy the sun for a little bit. Um, and today we had there was quite a few flavors actually. There was mango, there was honeydew, I believe. Yeah, honeydew. Honeydew, or was it cantaloupe? It was melon. It was a green It one. was green, it was yeah, green. Yeah. Okay, was honeydew. honeydew, and there's chocolate and vanilla, and then there was also some gelato, so for anyone that was lactose intolerant, and I didn't even look at those flavors, so I don't know what they were. But I saw <laughs> two smaller gelato ones. Um, there are no cones. So it's all in a bowl. Cones get stale. Cones get stale. So I guess cones are messy. Yeah. yeah. Um, did I answer all the ice cream questions? <laughs> Sounds like someone's There's craving ice, ice cream. Yeah. Was that squid? Oh, uh, it's a little yep. fish. It's a fish. Yeah, it was right there. I don't know what kind. There it goes again. So surf season beginning in Hawaii. Yep, we're starting to get into it. I think like right now is like is right when it starts. Yeah, I winter think. swells are rolling. Yeah, in. winter swells. I think the right when we we're about to leave was when the first kind of good surf swell was coming yeah. in. I think it was the week before we left. Like uh, the biggest swell came through yet. And it was it was quite large, especially yeah. over here on Oahu. Um, yeah, but it's winter time is the big swell time. Yeah, so last year we got the treat of the Eddie Cow running. Uh, and so that is a surf competition that will only run if the waves are over 40 feet yeah. in, in Waimea Bay. And so it ran for the first time in like six years, six or seven. I think the previous time was 2016. It was the year before I moved to Hawaii. So the last time it ran was 2016 and then it just ran last year. 2022 so um mike and simon since you guys deal with the rov has since we've been inked have you ever have you noticed any ink on the rovs when it comes up or does it kind of all get washed off it kind of all gets washed yeah. off that's what yeah, i figured it's, uh, and then uh, what is the rov care once you get them back Say that again? Or is <laughs> like that the care. Like uh, I know, I see you guys washing them down. Oh, like what's your down. your shutdown, shutdown procedures? For, yeah. Yeah, we do give, give it a fresh water rinse. Um, obviously, salt water is a lot more corrosive than uh, than fresh water. So we we'll rinse the ROV down with fresh water. We'll uh, check the oils, um, make sure everything there. is. We uh, just got inked. Oh, yep. We ship did. shape. Um, Check all the lights and functions, cameras, make sure nothing's come loose during the dive. Oh, you can there see the so squid see spinning around. Two squid yeah. in front of us. We witnessed in a couple of years ago, 
um, the squid would ink but hide in the ink cloud, <laughs> which was uh, behavior that apparently not been seen before. It was yeah, kind of, it was uh, really pretty with the one. lights. <laughs> yeah, that one was spinning around and yeah, we definitely... Lost all his arms. <laughs> Poor squid. <laughs> right. Bigger on back. <laughs> All right, sorry, Simon, you were explaining the shutdown procedure. Um, yeah, so we'll, we obviously uh, run on high voltage while we're, while we're subsea, so we'll disconnect from high voltage and we'll connect to uh, a 110 supply for deck voltage to check um, everything still works as it should um, when it went off deck as to when it came back on deck. Make sure all cables are still secure, make sure the oil is still good. We also check that there's been no water got into the oil itself so we'll take uh, water checks um, just make sure that we get just oil coming out of the RV and no water um, and yeah and any fix anything that stopped working during the dive started to see a lot more squid coming yeah. up into 50 meters again um, and for the chat it was matcha melon that is exactly actually the type of ice cream it was and um, they also are reporting in the chat that according for the orcas that were doing the attacking the boats that there have been three sinkings and over 200 interactions. Three sinkings. Three sinkings. Three boats have been sunk by orcas wow. and 200 interactions since 2020. And they've actually banned certain types of boats from the area because of this. Wow. So maybe they seem to be targeting a certain type of boats. And they think that it's just for fun and that the orcas are playing with the bath toys. And that's what I tend to mm. think. I think the idea of revenge seems a little bit... A little uh, anthropomorphizing yeah. on them. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's more they just think it's kind of entertainment. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right, we're fastly approaching that 50 meter mark. We're about 54 meters. Our water temperature is 26.7 degrees Celsius. So we are going to sign off for tonight. Thank you so much for staying tuned. We appreciate you and we will talk to you on Tuesday. Bye y'all. Bye. Bye. Uh, control, Dick. Go for control. Yeah, uh, just looking at the lights here, it looks like that uh, Atlanta and Her Herx uh, over the port. Copy, we are, copy back, Dick, we are trying to correct. Uh, uh, we can hold off here and uh, once you're in the goalpost there, we can... Uh, start even in again. Great, stand by. Maintain the current heading and track a line at bearing 040, please. And bridge, bridge, control. The control bridge, okay, Roger, 040, okay. Track. Thank you.
uh, control deck, uh, it looks a lot better here from uh, my viewpoint anyway.
Uh, control, uh, can you uh, get her to just kick ahead? All stop on Herc, that's perfect. Copy, all stop. All stations, that's uh, the crane secured to uh, Hercules starting to recover. Copy.
all stations, uh, her passing the transom. Okay, Herc's under the crane. Coming up out of the water. Copy.